Hi, Sophie. I'm going to be talking about your portfolio today. Before I get into the nitty gritty of talking about every individual piece, I'm going to speak about your portfolio as a whole and I'm going to talk about what things are working and what things I think you can improve upon. The first thing I'm going to talk about is your understanding of form and volume. I'm particularly looking at this image you have of the chair that's covered in a cloth and wrapped by this rope. I think this is a really strong start to understanding form and value and I can tell what's underneath the cloth just by looking at the way you've drawn it and it's really really strong. You have a lot of good uh, indications of what kind of folds there are uh, the drop folds versus zigzag folds and and what have you it shows that you have an understanding of how to create 3d objects and without this uh, fundamental knowledge it's going to be very difficult to draw other things especially something like the human figure in your artist statement you mentioned how you were interested in character design and this is a, a great start to learning how to do that for the future i would also recommend taking three software classes or learning how to use something like zbrush or maya or anything that will help you to learn how to sculpt in three dimensions because based on the way the industry is going right now people who are very versatile like that are gonna be really really set i applaud you for your early understanding of form and volume uh, and another piece where i'm seeing this is in your portrait image of the hand on the face and it looks like there's fire in the background now i'm going to speak about this piece um, more in detail later on this piece i would say in terms of form and volume needs a little bit more work it comes from understanding the planes of the face you can find many references online of what that exactly looks like but what i mean by that is just the different sides of the face the different sides of the hand and the wrist and things like that could use a little bit more depth the areas like where the hand actually attaches to the face or actually is making contact with the face rather i think you could indicate some more shadows there to show that they're actually separate forms and they're not just blending in with one another unless that's what you're going for now i I know that this piece has some melting and maybe that is what you're going for but i think you should still separate it a little bit more your understanding of values i think could use a little bit more work when we think of values it's usually at a scale between one and ten with one being the lightest and ten being the darkest and primarily what i'm seeing from you especially in this piece is values between one and two and eight and nine and so you want to have some mid-range values in there anything between a three to a seven as well and you want to be selective about where you place those and if you want to find some some good reference for that i would suggest looking at some golden age illustrators like norman rockwell and uh, lion decker and frank frazetta do some value studies of their famous works spend no more than five to ten minutes on them and maybe do like 50 to 100 of these things um, just to get you to understand how to put values together and how they use it to tell a story. One tip I can share about that is when you're doing these value studies, only use three or four values. Don't worry so much about the object as the shape because sometimes the object itself is really just extra filler, but what they're really trying to do with their composition in their shape is point you to that focal point. So I think you should really pay attention to that. I also noticed in your artist statement, you mentioned that you are really interested in comics and you might have read something like Hellboy by Mike Mignola, who used a lot of flat, or, or a lot of stark black and a lot of stark white in his pieces. Very, he uses very little gray, and maybe that's part of your influence. I still think you should get some of this understanding of mid value range in your work as well. Your color sense in some pieces is working really well and other pieces not so much. But the piece I really like for this is your painting of the woman in the, in the, the Chinese portrait style. I really think the colors are beautiful in this one. I think they're bold, they're fun, It's uh, it, it seems romantic, and if you want to keep improving on this, I would suggest doing color studies or color keys from different like Disney and Pixar films. You may or may not know, but one of the things that companies like that do, or those, or Disney and Pixar do, is that they uh, do color scripts for every film that they create so that they know exactly what scene, what each scene is going to look like before they actually go into all the work of producing it so that they can make sure that they're getting off the right mood and the right feeling before all the hard work is done. There's some great ones from films like Moana and like Toy Story 3 and Up and The Incredibles. And I know I just named only Disney and Pixar there, but there's plenty of them around and I really think that that would help you. So now we're going to start going into your individual pieces. And the first one I want to talk about is your figure drawings. So the first thing that 
I'm seeing here is your line quality is suffering a bit. You're doing a lot of what most artists will call pecking or feathering. And that basically just means that you're doing a lot of ticks and a lot of marks, but, but they don't really add up to anything. It's almost like chicken scratch. Primarily what that comes from is this feeling or this inhibition to draw something because you don't want to make a mistake. And so the artist will go, oh, I'll put a little bit here. Oh, I'll put a little bit here. I'll put a little bit here. And what it does is it creates a piece that doesn't look unified. That really just comes from practice and getting more comfortable with drawing. Some other things that I could recommend for you when it comes to these figure drawings as um, these two pieces that you have here is one, focus on your landmarks, particularly in the left piece, you have landmarks like the pit of the neck or which is basically like the meeting point of the clavicle bones. And then you have the nipples, uh, you have the belly button, you have the crotch, knees, and the bottom of the feet. Those landmarks, understanding the distance between them will really help you when it comes to figure drawing and making your figures look believable, especially since you wanna do character design. Uh, I know you've expressed interest in that. And so those things will really, really help you making sure you understand where they're supposed to be placed, how to use them to achieve um, an understanding of balance and form and volume and all of those different things. Something that I would also recommend is to learn the muscles and the bones in the figure, because in order to draw something, it's better to learn how to do it from the inside out in a lot of ways. So learning the makeup of it will help you determine what it will look like on the outside, sort of like how you did with the chair um, and, and, the, and the cloth. Uh, it's a lot like that. Something else I would also say about your drawing on the right is I don't want you to be afraid to draw through the figure. Uh, right now, particularly on the figure's right leg or the one that's extending to the far right, th this figure doesn't appear to have a right thigh. And that just comes from not understanding the anatomy as well. So I would really focus on that and just make sure you're drawing through the form, under trying to understand the figure in three dimensions. This will really help you. These look like gesture drawings. So I assume these drawings took maybe between two and three minutes. And gesture drawings are supposed to be loose and they're supposed to be fun and enjoyable uh, and sometimes even relaxing. Uh, so don't be afraid to make a mistake. These drawings aren't meant to be perfect. It's meant to get you to loosen up and to, um, and to just kind of get a feeling for it. So it takes a long time to get the figure right. It, it's, it takes a lot of practice, but take those things into consideration and I'm sure you'll improve over time. The next piece I want to talk about is uh, your piece with the red sky and the monsters attacking. Overall, I think this is probably the piece with the best composition throughout your entire portfolio. There are still some things I would consider though, and I'm going to say this a few times throughout your portfolio review, is what is your focal point? And the focal point is something that the viewer is supposed to look at right away. I assume it's going to be the figure on the left because he's standing up tall, he's very dark and very menacing. And that's fine. However, you have the moon just above them, which is about the exact same size. It's very contrasting compared to the sky behind it. I'm not sure what you want me to look at first, the moon or the figure. And that's going to be very, very important. So if you want to fix that, if your focal point is the figure, I would just make the moon a lot smaller. You could have it in the same place. That's not the problem. It's it's the size of it compared to the size of the, he um, the head of your figure. I would also consider atmosphere perspective in this piece. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically the idea that the further things go back into space, the lighter and less contrasting and less saturated they or more desaturated they become because there's atmosphere or air or oxygen blocking the object from our eye. So you can see this if you just go outside and look at some cityscapes or look at mountains in the distance, you'll see that happening. You have the buildings in this. They're the most stark black thing you have in here. They're even darker than your actual figures. So I would actually change that. I would lighten up those buildings a bit so they don't draw our eye as much. I would also consider the size of your objects. Like the telephone poles are almost the same size as your figure on the right. So I don't know what is more important. I would also consider where you crop your image. Something I learned while in art school was if you do, if it's not serving the point of telling the story of your image, if it's not helping you in any way, then just cut it out. You don't really need it. And so I'm seeing that primarily in the bottom right, your piece, where there's not really much there. One thing I would consider is either cropping it or you can use that as a way to point your viewer to the focal point. So you have these misty clouds on the bottom. What if you change the direction of them so that they actually point it up to your focal point to that figure? I think that will be a really clever way to, to disguise that area that doesn't really have that much going on and make it a very important point for your piece.
like I said earlier, that your strongest area is in this particular piece is your volumes and understanding form and shape. Uh, I think your weakest area, and I said this before, is in your value structure. And the reason I say it's the weakest is because I don't know where your lighting is really coming from. And light is incredibly important because without light, it's complete darkness and you have you, we wouldn't be able to draw or paint anything. Almost all of that cloth has white in it. It's a little too much to the point where I don't know where to look first. Again, you want to have a focal point in your image. You want to save your highlights or your brightest lights for those moments where um, either by where the light is hitting it the most so that it makes sense or by your focal point. I don't think you should even really use much of your white on the left side of that chair at all. I know there would be some reflected light, but it's a little too strong what you have here. I would also think about uh, what color this cloth is, because that will also determine how much white you use and how much black you use, because I know it looks like you're using charcoal. If your cloth is gray, then it's going to look very different than something that's very saturated red. The way that it looks in real life will really determine how you draw it. And that was something that I was told in art school a lot, and it, it's hard to make sense of it sometimes when you're not using color, but you really want to think about that as you approach it. For example, if you're doing a yellow cloth that's very light and the value range is very, very minimal, then you don't want to have so much contrast in there or put so much of a value range in there as you would if it were a dark blue. I really, really like the anatomy on those hands. They look very solid. Uh, they look like there are bones and muscles and tendons going through those hands and veins, and I can, and I, I believe it. Though the one thing I will consider, or I will ask, is that you consider the lighting, because I'm not really sure where it's coming from. In some areas, it looks like it's coming from the right side, and then in some areas, it looks like it's coming from the top left. I don't know how far to the right. I'm seeing this mostly in your wrists. If you look at the wrist on the left side, uh, or on the, the left wrist, um, the hand, and, and you look at how bright that is compared to with the right side, it's a little confusing because if the light is coming from the right side, then the wrist on the right or closest to the light source should be brighter. I would also consider uh, what story is it that you're trying to tell here? Is it just that the hands are, are, are tangled in this small string or is the whole body wrapped? Depending on what story you're trying to tell, you would have a completely different composition. That will really tell the story of your piece a lot more than a well-defined drawing can. Since this piece seems to be about being constrained and being close-knit and not being able to move around, sometimes a really tight composition or claustrophobic composition will really help you with that. I would actually cut off like the top third of that of the piece um, and maybe even pull in on the sides as well. You don't want to cut the fingertips off, but cut it in enough where you get the feeling of, oh no, I'm trapped. I'm uh, My fingers, my hands are trapped in this red string. Psychologically, if you do that with the composition as well, it will, be, it will read as a much stronger image. Again, I want you to consider your focal point. Usually when we see a face, the first thing we want to look at is their eyes. You want to give us a reason to look at the eyes in this particular piece, if that is um, really what you're going for. Now, if you want us to focus on the background or the dripping on the neck or something like that, then I would change the composition entirely so you would get us to focus on that. But if you're, if the eyes is where you want us to look first, maybe have some dripping on the eyes or, or your glasses or, or something like that. I, I think that will really help help the story of the piece too. I would consider the reality of your scene, meaning is this a metaphorical fire that's in the background or is it uh, literal? If it's literal, then I am not quite sure I, I believe the pose that you have here because the figure looks very nonchalant, like hand on the face, bored. I wish there was something for me to do and this monstrous fire is happening in the background. That's not 100% believable if it's something that's realistic. If it's metaphorical and I think that's where you're heading, I would try and find a way to amp it up a lot more. You have a lot of dripping on the face and on the neck. I would amp it up a lot more. What if half the hand was melted 
or like maybe half the cheek was completely something out of a Salvador Dali painting. Find ways to exaggerate your story. Usually in general, it's better to exaggerate than to hold back because it's easier to, to take away than to add to sometimes. Like I said before in the intro, I really, really love the colors in this. I think the pinks and the reds are working beautifully. I love the contrast between that and the blue sky. And, and I really appreciate how calm the scene feels. And you're achieving that by way of putting a lot of horizontal marks particularly in the background when you want a piece to feel calm and relaxing you will put a lot of horizontals in your composition i don't know if you've ever seen anyone like bob ross there's plenty of his stuff on youtube and you know sometimes his stuff comes off as kind of cheesy but you'll notice in his compositions that he uses a lot of horizontals and it feels calm you feel at peace you feel like you're in the cabin in the forest and no, there's not a care in the world and part of the secret is the horizontal lines and you're doing that here and it works really really well it even if it's so as subtle as those clouds in the background i will say that something i think you can improve on is the placement of those flowers because they are calm and they are painted really really well but I don't know where you want me to go with them. I can tell that they're falling, but are they pointing to something? If you want the focal point to be the face, which I'm sure that's that's the case, then uh, maybe have the flowers subtly swaying so that they point directly to the face. And even the ones that are falling down, maybe you can have one come down beneath her chin and or, or her neck or something and have it swaying, but it's still your eye to the face. Uh, I think something like that that's really subtle it will really, really, I think this is one of your most successful ones in your portfolio overall. The first thing that comes to my mind is what are you trying to say with this piece? What kind of story are you trying to tell? Because as an artist, you're a storyteller by nature and there's something that you want to get across. I would think about, and this goes for all of your pieces um, in your portfolio now and in the future, what is it that you're trying to say? And, and also that goes with emotion as well. What emotion are you trying to get from the viewer? If you're trying to get disturbed out of this piece in particular, then I think you're doing it pretty well. It's really creepy looking. I have a feeling that that's what you're going for. And so in that case, I would say it is successful. If it's a piece about being overtaken by some unknown force or i'm going to use the word symbiote even though it's very spider-man uh, if it's being overtaken by some unknown uh, substance like that then you could have something like drips or something that looks sticky or just just really gross on the skull the other thing to think about is what this object is used for what is its purpose is it an idol is it a portrait of someone's real head and it's their or is it their brain or something like that is it, you know there's a lot of questions you could ask with this piece i'm not saying you necessarily have to add anything to it maybe for general audience making it more clear as to what you're trying to say will help the audience read it more I think your composition is a little too centralized and it's accentuated by the fact that you have one point perspective going on here. You really want to save your centralized compositions for showing like a king on a throne or a deity or something really powerful that someone who brings order and whether it's peace or dictatorship, you want to save centralized compositions for that kind of moment. So with something like this, I would completely change the composition because the most interesting thing is is actually in the paint that is being spilled because you have clouds and there's birds flying in there. So I would find a way to focus a lot more on that. You could still show the canvases of uh, and the paint buckets and everything like that, but that's where my eye is drawn. I would find a way to focus on that. The other things I would think about are how you indicate texture. The way you would paint or draw a tree or a bush is gonna look very different than you would a flat wall. With this piece, I'm looking at the gray wall in the background and I see a lot of individual paint strokes and it, it doesn't really read as a believable wall. A real wall would look much more flat. There would not be a, as strong a tone shift throughout and it'd be more like a gradient. Same with the floor. There's a lot of really stark changes in value. I don't know if that's supposed to be a, the wood paneling on the floor or if that's supposed to be some sort of shadow it's a little confusing if it's shadow then that would mean that there's light coming from behind those canvases and you would have to indicate that as well there would be some rim lighting on the canvases those shadows would be much darker if your clouds and your birds and and the spill paint is your focal point i would primarily put your emphasis on that and that would also mean cropping the first quarter of that painting because there's not really much going on that wall anyway if it's not adding to your piece just take it out 
the first thing I recognize is that this is a platter of food, but we're not at any sort of dinner table or any sort of, uh, there's, there's nothing in the background that's indicating that, that there's more story to it. Maybe I'm biased because I just really like stories and storytelling, but what would happen if you were to take this picture, the paper underneath it looked like a picnic table or it looked like a dinner table and you had utensils and cups and glasses around it. I think it would sell the idea even more of something that's that's a platter of food, especially because it looks like the apple, the red apple is so saturated and so different than everything else you have on here that that would be the focal point. If you made everything kind of muted and brown or even um, you can even go into like a green territory since red and green are complementary colors. If you put that in the background, I think that would also really strongly as well. Just like I asked with your previous piece, uh, what story are you trying to tell here? Uh, why is it that the eyes and the snout are seem to be like bleeding this black fluid stuff? Some things to think about because if I'm looking at a piece of yours and I'm asking all these questions, even if you're not there to tell me, you should have an answer for everything that you do. It becomes very obvious to a trained eye when an artist is not thinking as critically about a certain piece or about every little detail that they put. You don't want to be in that position where someone asks you a question and you just say, I don't know. And I'm not saying you're doing that in this piece in particular, but just for future reference, consider those things because it'll make your piece that much more strong, especially if you can justify it. The first thing that I'm going to say is that you have the perfect color palette if you wanted to do a sunset overlooking the water kind of painting. It's perfect for that. And because of that, uh, the painting feels very calm, which is really interesting because you have all these swirls and radial lines going pretty much throughout the entire painting. So I, I really like that contrast there. It's very interesting. One thing I, I want you to take note of is the direction of those swirls. Like, where are you trying to get my eye to focus? Because you have on the outskirts, the painting, it's all a circle. And then on the inside, you start to do this kind of S curve all throughout. Some of them are kind of pointing towards the center and some of them aren't and they're going the opposite direction. And I'm mostly seeing that above the circle. One thing I will say though, is that I would pay attention to the rule of thirds, which is a composition rule. And if you don't know what that is, basically what it is, is if you were to take a piece and split it into thirds horizontally and vertically at the same time, you would then create nine squares and four intersection points. There, there would be one at the top left, top right, bottom left, and bottom right. And those four points are what you would call like golden spots for putting the focal point of a composition. And it could be in any one of those four corners. So in this one you have here, this looks like it would fit really well in the bottom left. I would change the composition just slightly so that you can put it in that in that golden spot and to be honest you don't really have to touch the painting at all you could just take this into photoshop or something like that and crop it slightly differently it'll create a much more pleasing composition it, it will really draw the eye to the focal point the eye just naturally goes to that place there's been plenty of studies done uh, showing that this will be a golden opportunity for you to implement that in this piece the composition here, I actually do like. I like how you have this kind of T shape. My eye starts in the top left and I go down through that st uh, the stitching line into that intersection point, the right side. The same is happening when I start at the bottom of the piece and move up. So I think you're nailing that pretty well. The one thing I, I will focus on though is the way you're blending your paint and, and also your choices of color. I think for this piece, you really want to have a limited palette and only choose like two or three colors and then use all the other stuff in your arsenal as hot spots or like little accent marks. Because when I look at what appears to be blood, I'm just gonna assume it's blood, it has every color in the color spectrum. I see reds, I see oranges, I see yellows, I see greens, I see purples. And unless you're trying to make a rainbow, you really don't need all that much because what it starts to do is neutralize the colors that you already have and it starts to make it look really muddy in a not so pleasing way. I don't mind if it has more of a blue or a yellow look, but uh, I would just keep it contained and keep it consistent. That's the, the biggest concern I have. As far as the stitching goes, I think that all looks fine. It definitely looks gruesome. So <laughs> I think you, you've nailed that. Just those little notes about the color I would consider. And also considering this is probably skin, I wonder why you, you've chosen like a bluish greenish yellow 
to represent the bruises and the scars on the skin. If you have a reason for that, that's fine. But because the audience that you're going for might not be as familiar with it, and because you're mixing it with a lot of red, it might not be as convincing. So if you want to completely change the color altogether, I would choose a limited palette. But if you're really trying to get this to just read as blood and gruesome and stuff, sticking with the reds and you know, maybe a little bit of purples or something like that and oranges, I think those will be fine. Really like how you're using a variety of different mediums. You're using a lot of drawing, painting, and sculpture, and that's really something that's really good to have in your portfolio. As far as this piece goes, I really like how you have juxtaposition between the hardness of the metal bones of the rib cage and the softness and the yarn-like texture of the heart. Really appreciate that, and I think this is one of your more uh, clear depictions um, in terms of your sculpture. Uh, I really appreciate it. I think it has a good storyline, and uh, it, it's something that's relatable to all of us because we all know what a rib cage looks like. I applaud you for that. But just a small note on presentation, this line that shows the corner of the wall in your photo is a little distracting. I would try and find another angle or try and crop that piece out of the image overall. And also this little thumbnail image that you have in the top left corner. It's a little distracting because one, it kind of has a tangent between the edge of the photo and the rib cage. And it's also a different tone. Um, if you want to include another image just to get a different angle, I would actually just put the two images side by side. In this one, your atmospheric perspective is really working, whereas in the piece with the red sky and the monsters and all that, there was a little bit of difficulty trying to read the space. But this one, you're nailing it. I love how you can go back and it, seems, it feels like the forest or those trees just go back forever for miles. The details that you have in the foreground are much more strong. It's reading a lot better. So I, there's a definite separation between foreground and background. With that being said, I think you can push the foreground a little bit more. And what I mean by that is when things are closer to you, um, especially since you're so dependent on line in this piece, I would just make thicker lines in some areas. It doesn't have to be all over the place. You don't want it to look like a cartoon. Using your line weight to indicate where the shadows are can be a really nice touch. So for example, in top hand, there's a little area um, between the thumb and the top of the finger, the index finger, where you could put a nice thick line, kind of like how you have on the top of the bone right there, right underneath that same little area. I think that would really, really be helpful. As a rule of thumb, where your light source is, put a lighter, thinner line, and the side that's not facing the light source, make it a little thicker and darker. That will help indicate depth and lighting as well. This piece is really symmetrical. Unless you're going for like a playing card or something like that, I would just be a, be aware of that. Symmetry in pieces don't always work unless you're trying to say something super specific. And like I said, it's usually for a scene with like a throne or a king or a deity or something like that, that's usually the best times to, to use something like that. I would explore with your composition overall and don't be afraid of making mistakes. That That's what artists do all day long is we make mistakes and we find a way to fix it later on. Uh, I have to say, I really like this one. I love the way you're doing your hatching. I like the shapes that you're using. It, it's very fun and very creative. It's it's like a mix between like a Dr. Seuss and Salvador Dali kind of in terms of imagination and, and shape language. And I really, really like that. It's very fun. I think the piece that stands out the most to me and not for the right reasons is the leaf. And the reason is because in the image on the left and the right, I'm just going to assume they're trees or just going to say they're trees. They have this swirly S shape and you have all these fun elements to it. But the tree, I'm sorry, but the leaf in the middle is very symmetrical. Like I just stated before, symmetry is something you don't always want to do. It doesn't even feel like part of the same set. Uh, yes, you are doing the cross hatching and all of that, and it looks really great. I'm not saying that the drawing is bad, but I think just the context you're putting it in, I think could be improved on because it's so different than these other two. One way to improve that is if you were to you just change the shape slightly, you know, instead of having it go up and down, you can make it curve a little bit, the root of the tree. It doesn't have to be all that much. Another element to connect all three. I think that's the only thing you're really missing here. So overall, Sophie, uh, I think you have a pretty strong portfolio. I think your strengths 
are when it comes to your versatility and in, in terms of your use of medium and the, the stories you want to tell i think are also pretty strong the areas i think you need work in and it's just the fundamental stuff of understanding some things about value and color composition things like that your artistic mindset is in the right place you have a lot of great ideas you have a lot of things you want to say i think the only thing that needs to be worked on is just honing that in and showing how you can rep best represent that in your pieces. But I think you have a really strong portfolio. Work on those things that were mentioned. I hope it's been a great help to you. Thank you for letting me critique your work. And I hope to see your work in the comic store one day, or I hope to see your character designs in, uh, in shows and movies and all of that stuff. So best of luck to you.